Everyone knows you can't beat the comfort of a pair of Crocs. But style doesn't get talked about enough. The edgy look and feel of the Echo Clog will bring your streetwear game to the next level. Plus, there are tons of new and exciting colors that'll match the look you're going for. It's time to bring the heat and build your look with Crocs Echo Clog. Shop the Echo Clog collection on Crocs.com. Make this new school year an opportunity for your kids to learn important life skills with Greenlight. Greenlight is a debit card and money app for families where kids learn how to save, invest, and spend wisely while parents keep an eye on kids' money habits. Greenlight also helps families get into their fall routine with a chores feature that lets parents assign chores and pay kids allowance when they check them off. Get your first month free at greenlight.com slash Spotify. Greenlight.com slash Spotify. Greetings, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here with you once again for another Episodio Especial. This is the China History Podcast, and I have with me today author Mr. Scott Crawford. Some of you are already familiar with Scott's work. His books include the novel Silk Road Centurion, a work of nonfiction on the Han Xiongnu Wars, 133 BC to 89 AD, and Hot Off the Press from one of the world's top publishing houses, Earnshaw Books, is The Phoenix and the Firebird, which he has co-authored with Alexis Kosyakov. And we're going to talk about all three titles today and a whole lot more. Scott Forbes Crawford, welcome to the CHP. Well, thank you so much, Laszlo. It's a pleasure to be here. You, you have such a wonderful show, and it's, a, it's an honor to be a guest today. <laughs> nali, nali. So you were born in D.C. and moved to Tokyo when you were eight. So tell me about this uh, exciting life you've led living outside the United States. Yeah, you know, that experience moving to Japan when I was eight years old really proved momentous. I spent three years there. So in some sense, it's not such a long time, but during really formative years for me. And I can say that time changed the course of my life. You know, I think it ignited a desire in me to explore kind of foreign worlds, um, new lands and cultures. And really to kind of uh, to tell stories about the contact between different worlds. And I think that became a real theme underlying a lot of my writing later on. You know, and I, I found it a really kind of enjoyable challenge to observe Japanese culture. It's, it's so complex. And from a position where I kind of lacked context, I, I lacked a lot of information and also lacked linguistic ability. But I had to kind of find a way to interpret what I was seeing. And I came to really enjoy that. And I think that was good training uh, to become an author. And I think it was also very good training for me when I moved to China uh, as a student, uh, a university student. So, and, and ever since, China's really been in my blood. Where did you study in China? Uh, at Beijing Shifan Dashui. So I was right in Beijing at the Beijing uh, Normal University for one year. Very nice. Well, we have a lot to cover. Let's start with the Han Xiongnu Wars. Where did the Xiongnu originally come from, and how big was their empire at its peak? So this is an answer I'm probably going to give you many times today, and that is the their origins are inconclusive, shrouded in mystery. Um, but I think we can we can roughly say they came from Mongolia. They were the sort of genetic evidence uh, indicates that they were descendants of what's called the slab grave culture of Mongolia, and you know kind of the contemporaneous speculation about it by Sima Chen, the author of the Records of the Grand Historian. He had his own view, which was that. They were descendants of, of someone named Chunwei, who was himself a descendant of the founder of the Xia dynasty, you know, that se semi-legendary uh, dynasty. Um, you know, that's probably not true, but it was, uh, you know, it's, a, it's certainly an interesting theory. And in terms of the, the kind of the landmass the Xiongnu controlled, at its peak, um, it spanned Siberia to kind of Xinjiang and almost certainly kind of maintained suzerainty over other areas, you know, kind of had sort of satellite control of other kingdoms who were either clients or vassals to them in kind of in the, in the region, uh, you know, along the northern and western borderlands of China. 
when did the Xiongnu first start showing up on China's radar? Who had to deal with them first? So there again, uh, you know, in the in the earliest days, it's it's speculative. Very likely, they served as mercenaries to various Chinese kingdoms during the Warring States period. When they really definitively enter the record is with the Qin invasion of their homeland, the the Ordos, um, which is you know the the region in northern China today, kind of bounded by the the loop of the Yellow River, and uh, so in 215 BC, the Qin, kind of newly newly united as an empire invaded the Ordos. They were especially interested in, in that area because it was, it was such a, lo- a lush pasture land for raising horses. And horses are so critical to the, to the ability to make war at this time. Uh, and kind of China's horse stocks and pastures were, were pretty mediocre. So that was one reason they, they, uh, they mounted this invasion, led by a general named Meng Tian in 215 B.C., that was a success. They managed to, to drive out the Xiongnu to the northeast and held, held that territory until the Qin uh, collapsed. And kind of amid that chaos, the Xiongnu kind of recaptured their, their territory. And ever since, they became a real kind of player in, in Chinese politics and a, and a thorn in China's side. Yeah, and a stone in their boot, too. So during Zhang Qian's two expeditions to the western regions, uh, 138 to 126 BC and 119 to 115 BC, what kind of run-ins did uh, this famous adventurer have with the Xiongnu? He had a couple, and they were both fascinating. Um, and he's a figure I really enjoyed writing about in my book. But at the same time, I'm a little bit miffed at him. So he, uh, you know, because because he had so much close contact with the Xiongnu, but failed to share many details about that in his in his reports. So he he was charged with a a, mission, a diplomatic mission to win over the Uyghur people who had been um ancestral enemies of the Xiongnu in a in a hope to kind of uh, form an alliance with the Han in, in to to battle the the Xiongnu. So he he traveled west but on the way, he was he was captured. Uh, I think about one year into his journey, and he was held, you know, captive or hostage for about nine years. It's not entirely clear what the sort of his status was, but some sources tell us that he had a Xiongnu wife and she bore him a son. But anyhow, he he spent he spent nine years, you know, enjoying Xiongnu hospitality one way or another only to be released or to escape and then continue his mission to the Uager. Sadly for him, it, 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 uh, it didn't quite work out. They weren't interested in fighting the Xiongnu. But he did kind of uh, discover the, the network of city-states in the region that you know, came to be known as the Silk Road. Um, and this became, uh, you know, very tantalizing to, to the Han court when he came back to report it. And I think it also helped them develop a strategy they, that they knew as cutting off the right arm of the Xiongnu, which was to kind of cleave off the, the support the Xiongnu had from these kind of settled kingdoms in the West which was a real kind of backstop for them when they suffered losses in their in their fight against the Han. So they could draw all kinds of resources. They could levy troops. They could take grain. They could take money from these these kind of allies and vassal states. Um, and that kind of kept them sort of, you know, kept them in fighting trim against the Han. So the strategy of the Chinese became to, to sort of, you know, to sort of peel that off, peel that away from them. And Zhang Chen was kind of instrumental in that. Yeah, anyhow, so, you know, I said I, I was a little miffed at him. I just, you know, it's just such a such a squandered opportunity because he was up close and personal with the Xiongnu like that, but really shared almost nothing about their kind of daily life. You know, so so I, I'm, I'm quite irked with him about that. Well, maybe he thought, eh, 2,000 years from now, who's going who's gonna to care about these guys? So besides the assassination of Tiberius Gracchus during a riot incited by his political opponents, what else happened in the year 133 B.C.? 
Well, that, it, was, it was a dramatic year uh, for China and for Rome. So since about 200 BC, since the advent of the Han, there was an uneasy peace that, that held um, between the two empires, the Xiongnu and the Han. This was through uh, what was called the Marriage Alliance, in which uh, Chinese princesses, you know, though, though the term was used loosely, were, were sent to the Xiongnu basically in return, as payment um, or protection money to kind of keep them from, from attacking China. Uh, it didn't exactly work, especially for the Chinese, but, you know, in that time, it restrained them from, from going to war with, against the Xiongnu, I would say, at a time when they weren't ready to kind of mount such an operation. But they, did, they used that time to stockpile weapons, to, to um, gather horses, and generally kind of mobilize for, for, for you know, the coming clash with the, with the Xiongnu. So when the Emperor Han Wudi came to power in 141 BC, he was, he was looking for ways to kind of make use of those, those assets and kind of settle the score with the Xiongnu. And then in 133 BC, they decided uh, they would attempt an ambush of the Xiongnu and try, to, try to, to decapitate them and kind of start and end it with one blow. They lured a Xiongnu force into, towards the... the the town of Mai uh, in Shanxi province, and attempted to sort of claim that you know a city wanted to go over to the Xiongnu and and they would kind of they could you know ransack it or control it and they they mobilized a huge number of men I think it was three hundred thousand kind of lying in wait to to fall on them, but in a way their their concern for collateral damage undid them. So all the farmers in the, in the area kind of cleared out. You know, they, they knew what was coming, and they didn't want to be any part of it. And as the Xiongnu approached Mai, they noticed that you know, all these fields that should have been filled with farmers were empty, and they smelled a rat. And they managed to escape bef- kind of before the, the, the Chinese trap could spring. And as a result, the Han missed their opportunity for this decapitating blow, and also, you know, lost all element of surprise. So, you know, that, that you know, very clearly put the Xiongnu on notice that their relations with, with the Chinese had changed. And so now both sides were, were preparing for war. So anyone familiar with history, yeah, they know Mao Du Chan Yu. So besides this powerful leader, did the Xiongnu have any other particularly noteworthy Chan Yus? You know, un- unfortunately, no one who can rival Modu's kind of color and braggadocio. He was such a kind of such an incredible character. You know, in his in his early life, he was held as a hostage to the Uyghur. He made a, a daring escape from them, and you know, later on, even as an old man, he was he was quite a character. Um, you know, I kind of think of him as a lovable scoundrel. You know, he sent a, famously sent a saucy letter to the Han Empress Dowager, kind of proposing sexual relations with her. So unfortunately, you know, no one to rival him. But uh, you know, I think you know, the one figure who's pretty well attested and who I really enjoyed writing about was Jurger. He was a leader of what became the Northern Xiongnu faction. Um, so there, there had been a civil war that broke out in 60 BC. And uh, by 53 BC, it kind of resolved into to two factions. Uh, so two brothers were at war with one another. Jurger and, and, his, and his northern Xiongnu were, were more powerful. And as a result, this led to something that previously would have been unthinkable, and that's the southern Xiongnu you know, defecting or making a treaty to, with the Han, you know, however you want to view it. And then the tables turned. And so suddenly the, the southern Xiongnu were resurgent and had access to Han support and Han allies. And this put the northern Xiongnu on the run. So Jurger went pretty far west, and there he, he built a fortress. And as, as, the, as a Han and kind of allied army closed in on him, and he, he ended up having a last stand against the Chinese you know, against this, against this army. 
And then so with the, the kind of the last of his men and even his wives and his concubines, he kind of mounted this, this last stand and, and fought valiantly uh, until it all ended with his beheading. You know, and what's what's notable, you know, over the the long course of the of the the Han Xiongnu War over centuries, he was the only Chanyu to fall in battle. And you know, to me, I find even though they're kind of lacking details about you know his personality, you can kind of glean a lot from from the choices he made, and really his his underdog status and you know almost romantic ending makes him a very compelling figure. Where were the battlegrounds of all the major confrontations between the Han and uh, Xiongnu armies? Did they fight in, in Mongolia? Was it in the Ordos region, Xinjiang, beyond Xinjiang? Where did they try and defeat each other? Uh, all of the above. You know, so the, the war spanned a huge period of time and space. And there were, so there were theater, theaters of battle, you know, kind of scattered all over um, uh you know, the sort of the, the borderlands and, and sometimes even on Ch- Chinese territory. You know, one battle, you know, the, what, what you could call the first battle of the Han Xiongnu War was Baidong, and that occurred in Shanxi. And that's also, you know, where, where the, the would-be ambush of, uh, of Mai occurred in 133 BC. Later in the war, you know, when the Han were not so much on the back foot, they kind of took the battle to the Xiongnu. And, you know, one, one really kind of watershed battle was Mobe in 119 BC. And that was somewhere in the Gobi Desert. The kind of the, the battleground, is, it's, it's not clear exactly where it was. Um, but at that point, uh, the, the Han were, you know, well, well enough resource, uh, resourced that they could mount these uh, expeditionary campaigns into Xiongnu territory. So that kind of spread the the sort of the battle space significantly and then you know later in the war the the conflict kind of shifted west and all these kind of proxy conflicts um you know became became sort of rolled into it you know one of those was the uh the campaign against da yuan in 104 bc Uh, this was uh, led by the chinese general li guangli and the the goal of this campaign was essentially again to claim horses, you know, the highest quality horses the Han could lay their hands on. And so uh, they ventured into Dayuan, which is um, kind of what's now Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. And this was a kingdom that was descended from kind of Hellenic peoples uh, who had come to the area during the the conquest of Alexander. And so they, you know, they, uh, they maintained, um, you know, these, these, you know, kind of wonderful horse stocks um, that the Han really lusted for. And so that also expanded the kind of the, you know, the scope of, of the war. And then, especially later on, towards the tail end of the war, Xinjiang and the Tarim Basin really became critical, kind of, again, for that same reason of the pursuing the strategy of cutting off the right arm of the Xiongnu. So they wanted to, you know, just deny the Xiongnu the kind of the resources that it were kind of keeping them standing, you know, because, you know, the Xiongnu faced, you know, one of uh, among the many challenges they faced in their in their battle against the Han, they was their their kind of lack of manpower. You know, they could not absorb uh, losses the way the Han could. The Han could all, almost always mobilize more men. They could just, you know, with their newly kind of united empire, they could draw from from kind of just such a such a reservoir of uh, of manpower. The Xiongnu could not, and so they were really dependent on these these kind of external states to to keep them in the fight, and that was very obvious to the Han. So, you know, towards the, uh, towards the, the latter stages of the conflict, kind of taking, taking control of, the, of, what, of what the Han called the Western regions was a critical part of their anti Xiongnu strategy. One general who really kind of can claim much of the credit for, for the Han's success there is Ban Chao. And he was a, quite, a, quite an interesting figure. He was from a scholarly family. You know, his father started writing the Han Shu 
and um, you know his brother and sister were were also literary figures and he he had that literary training as well but he also kind of had an adventurous spirit i think he was he was very inspired by Zhang Qian and his adventures and so he he pursued after his kind of you know literary training and working in a library he pursued a military career and he he was he was almost like kind of a special forces officer working in in the Xinjiang region often with very small forces working with with kind of native peoples and taking trying to kind of take control of these various city states sometimes that was through savvy diplomacy and sometimes that was through ruthless military action he had a real um penchant for um kind of cutting off heads and displaying them to people who were kind of wavering in their support of the Han. He found this was very persuasive. Yeah, even in the 20th century, it uh, it sent a message. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so, yeah, so, you know, so just to kind of sum up, in the, in the later stages, the kind of the, the Western regions were, were really where, where much of the Han Xiongnu War was fought, and often in kind of somewhat oblique ways, not directly against the Xiongnu, but against uh, sources of Xiongnu support. What kind of weapons were they used, did the uh, Xiongnu use during this 222-year period of conflict with Han China? Their most famous weapon, of course, was the compound bow. Uh, you know, that sort of, you know, it's almost kind of a, a talisman of, of steppe people from, from before, before the Xiongnu and, you know, kind of up until the Manchus and maybe beyond. The Xiongnu were, were kind of a, an, an equine empire. And, you know, from, from very, a very tender age, Xiongnu learned to ride and they learned to shoot and to, and to combine these. And that made them, you know, extremely formidable in battle. You know, these compound bows, you know, were, were made of wood and bone and sinew and took quite a long time to produce. But it gave them, you know, a tremendous range and power. And, you know, they could just sort of, you know, shoot, you know, multiple arrows per minute. And, you know, this kind of combination of, of archery and horsemanship made, you know, their, their ability to, to make war gave them very kind of useful attributes. It gave them speed, it gave them mobility, and the ability to kind of shoot from safe distances. And it, it took a lot for the Han to kind of come to terms with this and figure out how to counter it. One way they did this was by mass producing crossbows, which were also a very advanced weapon, one that had been kind of uh, used by the Chinese for centuries. That kind of gave them some parity in, in kind of matching missile fire with the Xiongnu. You know, but I think it also made the Han recognize that you know, their, their infantry forces were not so well matched against the Xiongnu. And so they developed another strategy they developed um, and kind of really, really longed for throughout the war and but only towards the end did they really succeed with was to use barbarians to fight barbarians so they wanted to find nomadic peoples who could fight just like the Xiongnu but would be kind of loyal to the Han or could be bought by the Han to fight them because they they recognized that you know that that's what it took to counter the Xiongnu you know, you, you mentioned already that there was a split amongst the uh, Xiongnu. When did they split up into northern and southern groups, and what caused this divide? I think this was during uh, Guangwu's reign in the Eastern Han, at the start of the Eastern Han. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's right. The Xiongnu kind of succession model was based on, it was a fraternal succession. So it, when a Chanyu kind of Xiongnu emperor died, it was typically his brother who inherited the crown, not the son. And so this kind of baked a bit of instability into the Xiongnu political system and resulted in kind of a, a, kind of a multitude of competing lineages for the Chanyu title. And all this erupted in 60 BC when a Chanyu died and there were, there were multiple contenders for, for, the, for the role. I think at one point there were five different men pursuing it. But over time, you know, it kind of was winnowed down to, to these two I'd mentioned before, Kuhanya and Jurjur, two brothers. 
and you know Jurger uh, had a had a much more uh powerful force i think he was a more gifted military leader than Huhanya, but he you know what once once his brother Huhanya went to went over to the han he he was you know found himself at great kind of in in, in grave danger so that's what happened with the civil war and you know the Shonu never really recovered from this. They had already taken many kind of devastating blows from the Han prior to this, and I think you know this, you know, this the civil war just kind of you know kind of posed an existential kind of um, put an existential kind of fracture in their empire. What about during the uh, the years of the uh... Han Dynasty uh, interregnum with Wang Mang, uh, nine to twenty-three A.D. Did he have to deal with them also? He did deal with them and very poorly. So he, you know, the Han had very hard-won gains, kind of in the western regions. You know what I what I kind of referenced before that they kind of they projected power to the Tarim Basin and beyond in order to de- deny Xiongnu their critical support. So in you know and they the the Han had a, had kind of treaties with with these various city states and, and kingdoms and often kind of uh, conferred titles on on the on these people and Wang Mang was kind of seemed to be very fussy about what titles people could have and you know through a series of kind of unforced errors he kind of found ways to kind of offend these leaders of these city states. And this drove them kind of back into the arms of the Xiongnu. So, you know, among among his other failings, he definitely, you know, kind of squandered, you know, all the, all the kind of progress the Han had made before this. You know, I guess f- for the Chinese, you know, the only kind of saving grace is I think, you know, the, the Xiongnu were kind of so reduced at this time that they couldn't fully capitalize on this opportunity again to to kind of strike against the Chinese and perhaps find a way to um, force them back to the bargaining table and reestablish the Huqin marriage alliance system. So tell me, who were the uh, women who became part of the Huqin system? Were they all Han royal princesses or any noble born? Who were they? Well, they tended to be from the court, but they were not princesses per se. Often they were highborn women of kind of disgraced backgrounds. You know, I know uh, one one of these women who was carted off to the Xiongnu was the daughter of a conspirator in the 154 BC rebellion of the Seven States. So she kind of maintained some of her her status, but not enough to kind of to stay to protect her from kind of being sent off to this kind of what what they must have thought of as terrible duty to the empire by by going over and, and marrying these Xiongnu up north, so they they tended to come from you know from yeah from the court, but they were not were not uh, high ranking princesses exactly. Some of them did become kind of famous in their own right. Wang Zhaojun is one example. She married the the Xiongnu Chanyu Huhanye, and kind of later she became immortalized and. You know, in Chinese ballads and storytelling, the women that I found particularly interesting to write about were actually those who didn't go to the Xiongnu but were peace brides to the Wusun people. They were another nomadic group the Han were trying to woo in the in their kind of bid to uh, sort of forge an alliance against the Xiongnu. And one of these women was sent. I think she was the first of the peace brides to the Wusun. And she only lasted about two, one or two years with them. She essentially died of a broken heart, and she wrote a famous poem about kind of how how sad she was, and that she longed to be like a wild swan flying home to China. She died kind of uh, under sad circumstances, but then her successor uh, was sent up there, and she cut a very different kind of figure. And she's one of the the subjects of of a chapter in my book. This was Princess Jiao, and kind of from the first, she was really seemed to want to make a mark for herself, and she essentially became over time a sort of a Han operative behind enemy lines. 
So she, she was feeding information to to Han emissaries who would come to visit the Wusun. She was kind of nudging nudging her husband toward toward the the Han banner, all the while kind of uh, vying against the the same this king's Xiongnu wife. Um, so there there must have been some uh, kind of interesting family dinners among them. So I, I really enjoyed writing about her because she just was such a kind of a, she seemed to be such a sort of a spitfire. She was involved in a, in a conspiracy to, to murder her husband with some Han supporters, with some Han soldiers that failed. She was kind of chased by his men and kind of narrowly survived. But she ended up kind of doing, serving, serving the Han Empire for, for decades until she was finally... I think at age 70, allowed to return to Chang'an, and she did, and and died shortly thereafter. But she got to kind of lay down her bones in the place that she had been kind of fighting for in her own way for year upon year. So I, I, I really enjoyed writing about her story in this. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. When your schedule is packed with kids' activities, big work projects, deadlines, and more... It's easy to let your priorities slip. Even when we know what makes us happy, sometimes it's just so hard to make time for what we truly enjoy. But when you feel you have no time for yourself, non-negotiables like therapy are more important than ever. Therapy can help you focus on your priorities, what you want instead of what you have to do, allowing you to start living your best life. If you find yourself in this boat and you're thinking about therapy, let me suggest once again that you give BetterHelp a try. The service is entirely online, which makes it convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. BetterHelp offers 24-7 availability. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get started and matched with a licensed therapist. Therapy sessions can be conducted from anywhere in the world, and BetterHelp makes it easy and convenient for you. And there are various subscription plans to meet different budgets and needs. Because BetterHelp is online, you can communicate via messaging, live chat, phone calls, and video sessions. You can schedule sessions around your personal schedule, including evenings and weekends. Hey, take control of your life with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash CHP today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash CHP. This ad furnished by Nesmet Taju LLC. Offer not valid in all states or where prohibited by law. Loans are subject to lender approval. See website for details. Honey, the credit card bill came, and we're maxed out. Great. Maxed out cards, rent is due, bills are piling up. We just need some extra cash to help us get by. We should do what my brother did. He went to GetCash.com and got $3,000. With our bad credit? GetCash.com is different. They're one of the largest personal loan networks. They can help people with any type of credit get up to $5,000. I'm sure there's a lot of paperwork. Nope. My brother said it was fast and easy. He did it right from his phone. If you have a regular source of income, you can be approved for a loan of up to $5,000 in minutes and your cash can hit your bank account as soon as the next day. Our lenders have millions of dollars to lend regardless of your credit history. Great news. I went to getcash.com and we'll have our money as soon as tomorrow. Wow, that is fast. If you need extra cash, go to getcash.com. That's getcash.com. Getcash.com. So what finally happened in 89 AD? So again, the Xiongnu were kind of really in a in a sorry state at this time. We're far from the might of of their their kind of their heyday during the the first decades of the Han, and another civil war had taken place. Uh, I think around forty six A.D. And so you know they were they were still a divided people, northern and southern, and the Han they managed to to kind of bring to their banner some ancestral enemies of the Xiongnu, such as the Xianbei, people who are, who are formerly vassals of the Xiongnu and really had a bone to pick with them. So the, so the Han was able to kind of form a pretty grand alliance against the Xiongnu. And in 89 AD, they, they mounted a campaign into the Altai Mountains led by a general named Dou Xian. And, it, you know, I think a few things are notable about this battle and kind of how how distinct it was from the earlier days of the war when there were some very kind of charismatic and you know very impressive chinese generals 
Doshian seemed to really be kind of a creature of the court. He enjoyed status because his sister was one of the wives of the emperor. And he didn't seem to have much of a military background, or at least it's not, it's not documented well. Nevertheless, this, this kind of milk toast leader was able to deal a crushing blow to the Xiongnu. And, and here again, the, the sort of the Han army did not represent the kind of the core of this force. They were a minority. It was mostly allies. So it was really the, the, the Chinese strategy of using barbarians to fight barbarians, finally kind of coming to fruition. And, you know, I, with, with Do, I kind of, in my book, I referred to him as just sort of being a cog in the Han war machine. You know, I think it was at at this stage, you know, so little was needed to kind of to sort of knock down the Xiongnu once and for all that even a middling character like Do uh, was able to do so. So anyhow, in this battle, you know, the the Xiongnu were killed in great number and put to flight. And, you know, there were some kind of flare ups from them in the in in the following years, but essentially as an empire you know, their, their days were at an end here. So it, it, you know, it, it essentially, you know, all concluded in 89 AD. You know, I, I think as with so many things with nomads and, and Central Asia, it's, it's difficult to be definitive about, you know, exactly when it ends. But I think, you know, that's, that's, that's sort of a clear cut kind of finale to the, to the Han campaign against them. So what ultimately happened to the Xiongnu after their defeat did they did they just vanish or just melt into the pot of Central Asian peoples? They didn't vanish as a people. They did as an empire, and they did as an existential threat to China. You know, what's interesting about the Xiongnu is that they thrived when, when China did. They thrived when China was united. You know, I think the first kind of 60 years of the Han Dynasty— the Han was very focused on on kind of keeping itself together, kind of putting down internal rebellions, and so you know they they supported the Xiongnu obviously very grudgingly through the the kind of the payments of the marriage alliance, and then later on when when ha, the Han went to war against the Xiongnu, they provided the Xiongnu with kind of a common enemy, a way to kind of you know gal- galvanize the various people across the Xiongnu Confederacy against, against one enemy. But then when China was, was divided, so were the Xiongnu, and, they, and that, that kind of weakened them. So I think that kind of definitely comes into play after the kind of conclusion of the Han-Xiongnu War. Anyhow, they kind of remained as players over the next few centuries of Chinese history, you know, but, I, but I think you know, your metaphor is a good one, and, and they did ultimately just sort of melt into the Central Asian stew pot. So let me ask a question. I mean, a lot of people wonder this. What's behind the theory that the Huns are descended from the Xiongnu? You know, Hungary, Xiongyali, uses the same character, Xiong, as in Xiongnu. So how did the whole Huns narrative begin, and how true is it? Here, here again, no conclusive answer. Um, big surprise. The theory is is based mostly on kind of linguistic evidence and and a belief that the contemporary pronunciation of Xiongnu was Hunu or Huna or something something close to that. You know, I think it's a question that's probably going to remain uh, forever unsettled. Um, you know, I guess it, generally speaking, my view is that you know, again, with these kind of ancient nomadic peoples, you know, they're just they're just too damn slippery to kind of pin them down. And, you know, the way they sort of swirl together makes it very difficult to kind of pinpoint lineages between one people and the next. They just sort of, they, they swirl together so kind of nebulously and, and kind of, you know, without obvious form, uh, you know, that it's just, it's just a very, a very, very difficult, you know, question to decisively answer. And uh, the Xiongnu, they they didn't leave any written records. And as far as I know, I don't even think they had a writing system. Do we have to exclusively rely on Chinese sources concerning the history of the Xiongnu? And also, has there been any notable Xiongnu archaeological discoveries made? You're right. It does not appear that they had a writing system. Uh, So, 
unfortunately, in many ways, we are beholden to the Chinese textual sources. Uh, Sima Chen was he he did he did kind of write fairly expansively about the Xiongnu, fortunately, but of course. That's, that's from limited exposure and with a with a very obvious bias. So yeah, and the the sources are pretty limited. Non Chinese sources are quite limited, very thin on the ground. There are some grave goods uh, available, and they're you know the the Shonu were famous metal workers, and there 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 are some kind of artifacts that still remain, and I think some textiles as well. And there have been some archaeological discoveries. I think many are still ongoing, you know, mostly of tombs of Xiongnu elite in Mongolia and, and elsewhere in Central Asia. And I, th- you know, I think there was a major uh, discovery in 1974. And some of the, you know, some of these tombs are still still being unearthed. So hopefully new discoveries are in the offing. So let's talk about your two works of fiction. What led you to write Silk Road Centurion? I mentioned growing up in, we we discussed my growing up in Japan and kind of a real interest in stories about outsiders and kind of foreign observers. And I moved to China in 2010 with my wife. And one of of my goals with that was to really make writing a kind of a, a much more kind of substantial part of my life. And I wanted to tell a story about that, that in some ways kind of echoed my experience in China, kind of being there as a student, learning. But at the same time, I didn't want to kind of write an expat novel. I wanted to do something that was very kind of exciting and adventurous and colorful than, than you know, the sort of the material my own life could provide. And so soon after we moved to, to Beijing, took a trip to Xinjiang. And I remember visiting the town of Tashkurgan, and it was there that I kind of realized that, you know, the Silk Road offered so much as a setting for, for the kind of the kind of concerns I had. It was just, you know, it's just, you know, you couldn't kind of you know, beat that. It's, it's just such a such a powerful, powerful kind of metaphor for a kind of cultural exchange. And then later on, when I read about a a Roman battle fought in 53 BC, the Battle of Carre, in which some of the survivors were kind of theorized to have been brought to the East. I felt like I had the makings of a novel, uh, and I and I set to work on it. How did your experience living in China affect the way you wrote it? You know, I I was I was never a uh, a prisoner of of nomads as my character Manius Titanius was in my novel. You know he's he's a soldier. He's he's kind of uh, you know very very capable you know as a fighter, but I, I'd say his kind of most powerful weapon he develops over the course of the story is, is his ability to communicate, and so his kind of acquisition of Chinese is an important plot point in the book, and there I kind of I I drew from my own experiences kind of glancingly. You know, I wanted to kind of capture some of the sort of the frustrations of learning a, a, a language as kind of uh, pitiless as Chinese. And, uh, you know, so that's and then, you know, and also in, in, in some ways not to kind of to go overboard, but to kind of capture that that feeling of sort of being an outsider in a, in a foreign society where where so much is happening that initially kind of seems beyond one's ability to understand. Why did you choose to write this novel in, on the uh, frontier rather than, you know, something easier in a city? Probably, you know, the most honest but but not very satisfying answer is because that's where the the characters and the story led me. But I would say, kind of in hindsight, there there are a few reasons. One, I thought by by setting in a kind of a, a place that you know where where so much is unknown, it gave me a freer hand as a writer. There's there's very little known about kind of how common people lived in the Han Dynasty. I think especially kind of in in agrarian settings. So on the one hand, this made it challenging, but it also gave me the freedom to invent, which I really enjoyed. And then another reason is you know, you know I mentioned visiting Tashkurgan, um, which is kind of in Xinjiang now, kind of near the um, the border with uh, Afghanistan and uh, Tajikistan. You know I knew that I didn't want it to just be 
sort of a binary story about West in the form of Rome and East in the form of China. I wanted there to be three civilizations at play, that, that third one being the Xiongnu, of course. And so I knew I needed to kind of set the story kind of in the borderlands if I wanted that. Otherwise, I'd have to really kind of contort the plot to have, to have my, my character Manius kind of zipping to the capital of Chang'an and kind of going back and forth. So, you know, so that was, that was another factor. And I think another one was I wanted to kind of tell a story at an intimate scale. I wanted my character, Manius, to really kind of carve out a place for himself in this small Chinese community. And uh, to, you know, just to, to do everything kind of at the, at the human scale rather than this being a novel about the sort of like the, the grand kind of forces of empire, of different empires. Um, you know, I think the, the epic quality comes from kind of how, how far Manius has to travel, literally and metaphorically, rather than it, you know, his, his sort of place in the sort of the movement of, of you know, the kind of the Han dynasty writ large. Did any historical events or figures find their way into the novel? Well, I mentioned the Battle of Kare in 53 BC. In short, the answer is the book is almost entirely imaginary. That's the only historical event that plays a part in my book. And there it sort of uh, kind of almost, almost occurs kind of off stage. That was a very kind of earth-shaking event for Rome uh, because at the time Rome was controlled by a triumvirate of three leaders, Julius Caesar, Pompey Magnus, and Marcus Licinius Crassus. And Crassus actually died in battle at Carre. So it had incredible reverberations back in Rome. And that's something that, that Manius kind of, kind of muses about, but it's not, it's not a central part of the, the story's action. You know, the other kind of historical events taking place are kind of also in the background, and that's, uh, that's the Xiongnu Civil War. So the story kind of occurs as the Xiongnu are kind of in a, in a, are, are fragmenting. And, you know, there are kind of hints of this throughout, throughout the book, um, but I don't really foreground it. But I hope for kind of those with a little familiarity with the history, it, it adds a little bit of zest. What contact existed back then between ancient China and Rome? Here, the records are not conclusive. Again, you know, there, there was certainly trade between China and what they called Dachian, but it happened primarily through intermediaries, such as the Parthian Empire. Um, the Parthians, by the way, were the, the foe that Rome fought in the, uh, in the Battle of Kare in 53 BC. They were basically the successors to the Persians. So there was definitely trade between the two civilizations. And I believe there, there must have been kind of direct contact but it just hasn't been recorded. You know, what we do know is that in 97 AD, the Chinese sent an expedition far to the west in, in the hopes of reaching Rome. They got as far as the, as the shores of the Persian Gulf, but there they were kind of convinced to turn back by the Parthians, you know, who claimed, you know, the, you know, onward lies great danger. And so, you know, they were convinced by this, and so, you know, I think they were, they, you know, these, you know, these, these locals were, were kind of um, motivated by the, to, they didn't want to jeopardize their kind of plum position as middlemen. So they kind of managed to, to turn the Chinese away. You know, and later on, there was a, uh, a Roman traveler, um, Maius Titianus, who possibly reached Tashkurgan, uh, that, that Silk Road station I mentioned earlier. There aren't really records of him journeying any deeper into the interior of China, um, but still he was really struck by how, how far he did make it. And I think especially because I, I had visited Tashkurgan, and it was kind of an important part in the, in the genesis of Silk Road Centurion, that I kind of wanted to honor him. So my character's name is sort of a, an homage to him, you know, I.S. Titianus and Manius Titinius. In ancient days... You know, there's, there's no clear evidence of direct contact between China and Rome, you know, but I, you know, I, I, I believe there had been there, you know, that, you know, humans are just very, you know, they're, they're adventurous spirits among us. 
you know, there are explorers and ones who want to kind of see, you know, travel well beyond what's known. So I think it happened, you know, and it just, it just hasn't been recorded. We've, it's been lost to posterity. That's my view. Hmm. So unlike with your uh, history book on the Han Xiong New Wars, here you could fill in the gaps in the historical record, especially with the, with the Xiong New. How did you go about doing that? Yeah, so I, I, of course, had a lot more freedom here than I did with the history book, you know, though I tried to use that freedom very carefully and soberly. You know, so I, of course, used every tidbit I could find, like, in the Book of Han and the records of the Grand Historian. I I used Herodotus and some kind of, uh, you know, some of his writings about the Scythian people. And, you know, but, but the Xiongnu were very elusive, and there were times when I really didn't know where where to kind of take the story when when we were up close and personal with them. I guess what I what I found as a kind of a a, a beacon through this was Shonu religion. You know, so they they were animists. They worshiped Tengri the the sky spirit and some and some other spirits, you know, kind of forces uh they perceived and you know, I just I believe that you know that would have such an such an influence on their worldview. So I kind of tried to read as much as I could about Shonu religion and kind of other religious practices of peoples of the area, even if of later times. Uh, you know, there was one book I found really invaluable in this. It was called Animal and Shaman by Julian Baldick. You know, very short, concise, pithy book. You know, but it, it kind of gave me a lot to work with both in terms of sort of, I think, showing new psychology and with some details about the, the specific kind of actions and various religious rites and so forth. And then, of course, kind of as I mentioned earlier, you know, because it was a work of fiction, I could extrapolate and take some material from, from later nomadic peoples who who were who you know you could see as descendants of the Xiongnu and kind of incorporate that into my narrative, you know. So I tried to be kind of judicious about these things, but I was also not kind of a zealot about you know something if if you know something occurred you know was was if there was some cultural practice in 500 AD. I, I allowed it to kind of also be present in 53 BC. You you published that book with uh, Camphor Press. How was it working with John Ross? He was he was a real big help for me when I was writing my History of Taiwan series. He he vetted all my episodes. You know, I'm not an editor myself, but I think I have a sense of what makes a good one, and it's a very kind of delicate balance, I'd say, where where you know, someone working with a man, with an author in a manuscript, you know, needs to speak out when they're when they're at the points where the writing needs to be improved or or can be um, clarified or kind of redirected, but at the same time, I think an a, an editor needs to be kind of disciplined and safeguard the integrity of the of the manuscript. And you know, in in my case, you know, John very he kind of fit this all to a T. I think he understood what the book was trying to do and where it needed to go, and he found ways to kind of help me amplify and kind of deliver what I was what I was pursuing. So you know, it was an, it was an absolute pleasure working with him. Do you listen to his podcast, the one he does with Eric Michael Smith, uh, Formosa Files? You know, I, I am a regular listener of Formosa Files. You know, as you mentioned before about John kind of vetting and reviewing your episodes focused on Taiwan, you know, he's such a storehouse of knowledge about Taiwan and, and insight about it. And I think that really shines through in every episode of Formosa Files. And they have, you know, the, the sort of the breadth of the show is, is just so amazing. You know, sometimes it's, it's quite wacky. And other times somber, you know, when it's dealing with the 228 massacre and, you know, kind of other weighty topics. So, you know, I think it's, it's, the show is just great as a, as a way to kind of gain kind of a really wide ranging kind of education about Taiwan in an entertaining fashion. Uh, and if I may, I, I'd like to mention how I'm kind of using that resource um, for a project I have underway right now. John Ross and I uh, discovered that we 
have a mutual love for old time radio. Uh, these are the kind of mystery and adventure shows of, of yesteryear, the, the shows that kind of really uh, enjoyed kind of a real, a real place in the culture for a few decades, only to be kind of pushed to the sidelines by, by te television. And I would say that's quite unfair, unfairly pushed to the sidelines, and I think John would agree as well. What's interesting now is that podcasting is allowing this sort of storytelling to to be resurrected, and I think that's you know that it's it's a really kind of worthwhile and fun way to tell stories. And John asked me recently to develop a pilot for a dramatized fictional podcast series drawn from Taiwanese history. It's shaping up to be a rip roaring kind of show. It's an adventure series hitting the various powers of the 17th century who kind of had eyes on Taiwan. You know, we have uh, Eastern powers, Chinese, Japanese. We have Western, Spanish, Dutch. We have, in, you know, the indigenous peoples of the island all kind of vying against one another for control. And it's, you know, it's, it's just such a joy to, to research and write this. And, you know, I'm just very thankful to have Formosa Files as a kind of a guide to find my way into and through the history of this. Yeah, John's such a super guy. Yeah, I also share John's, we discussed this, I share his love of old-time radio, you know, especially the old mystery and detective dramas, and I subscribe to about three or four of them. And, and as a youngin, I used to regularly listen to the uh, CBS Radio Mystery Theater and just loved it and never lost that. And yeah, it's great because podcasting is sort of reviving this whole audio drama format. And I mean, the market is the, the, the podcasting market is flooded with uh, so much new content. And some of it is just fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think you know, audio drama just has such a power to kind of immerse the listener into a world. I think in a way that's sort of similar to reading a book, you know, because it engages the mind. You kind of have to create the visuals for yourself. And I just, you know, I think that can be so potent in telling a story. So, yeah, and we're, I think John and I are both just terribly excited about, about where we can take this. Well, you definitely got a listener here. So you just recently had your third book published, and may I say, beautiful cover art. If books could be judged by their cover, this one's going to be a serious page turner. So this one was co-authored with your better half, Alexis Kosiakoff, The Phoenix and the Firebird. I saw you got the famous Paul French to give a blurb about the book. He said, quote, A Peking caught between an imperial city and a new republic. A world where harsh reality mingles with myth and magic. Warlords, exiled Russians, gangsters, a child in search of her father. There are worlds within worlds in Old Peking, real and imagined. Kosyakov and Crawford bring them all together into life. Congratulations on that. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, we were you know, so deeply honored by that endorsement from Paul French. His book, Midnight in Peking, you know, was such a influence and inspiration to us. Uh, I remember when it was published, you know, we were living in Beijing, and we read it, and very quickly were keen on kind of walking the same streets Pamela Werner had. You know, I remember there was, I think it was a cold January day, Paul French had kind of released an audio tour, uh, an audio guide, um, kind of uh, to, to help help a listener kind of move along a, a, a route. Uh, I remember listening to that and kind of exploring all these, all these little hutong and so forth that were so uh, kind of instrumental to the story. Yeah. And then another time my, my, my father was a huge fan of the book. He visited us in China and I, you know, I think it was, it was a highlight for him to kind of walk those streets and kind of, um, you know, follow the case as, as much as one could today. Yeah, and you know, so our book, it's primarily a children's book, which Midnight in Peking is decidedly not, you know, but still, 
th- that French's book was just, you know, such a such a kind of a guide to us um, in in writing about um, Beijing. Our story is set in 1920, but it's you know pretty close to I think his is 1936 and seven. Still very close to it, and especially in the scenes taking place in in Beijing and in the Badlands, it was just uh, you know such a such a powerful resource for us. Yeah, and, it, and you know, it's just it's just a, an incredible delight that he, um, you know, the, the author of that incredible book, kind of spoke in our favor. So briefly, tell us uh, what this novel's about, and you know, share what inspired you and your wife Alexis <laughs> to write it. The Phoenix and the Firebird is a historical fantasy novel. Uh, it's set in in 1920 in Beijing, and it kind of weaves together Chinese and Slavic folklore. The story is about a 12-year-old Russian girl named Lucy who had been living in Beijing for a few years as a refugee since escaping the Russian Revolution. In the meantime, her father, who's a Russian army officer, is fighting in the Russian Civil War. He's just sent her a letter saying that at long last he's going to come in and be reunited with her in China. So she she travels down to the train station, but when the, the train kind of wheezes in, it's, it's kind of riddled with gunshots uh, with bullet holes. There's no sign of her father, only a mysterious scarlet feather. And Lucy learns that her father has been abducted by a notorious warlord who has an army of cutthroats and also has been collecting all sorts of um, magical beasts and sort of uh, figures from, from the, the Chinese and Slavic occult. So Lucy and her best friend, a Chinese girl named Sue, set out to rescue Lucy's father and to stop the warlord's imminent invasion of Beijing. And what's, what inspired us, um, obviously, is a very fantastical story, but it was, it was inspired by Alexis's family history. So her great-grandfather was an officer in the Russian Tsar's army. And with the coming of the Russian Revolution, he and his family fled to safety to the, to the east, into Siberia, and then they made it into China. And they lived there for several years um, until ultimately emigrating to the United States. And I got to know this army officer's son, my my wife's grandfather, quite well. And I would always press him for stories about what it was like growing up in China in the 1920s. And in a little note in the book, we kind of even mentioned that, you know, he, he made a point of always saying, you know, he was living in Hankou, I guess what's now part of Wuhan. And, you know, whenever there was trouble with warlords, the French were the first to kind of roll out the cannons to fight them. He always made a point of, of, of that. But, um, you know, we, Alexis was really kind of dedicated to making use of her grandfather's life story in some way in writing. And eventually we decided that, you know, this would make a great project for us to collaborate on. And so, you know, after kind of, various incarnations we settled on making it into a children's novel and that became the phoenix and the firebird it's quite a departure from silk road centurion both in terms of uh you know writing for a younger audience and the addition of all these fantastical elements so what led to this decision a big part of it was that uh, you know so much of the kind of the the raw inspiration for the book came from her grandfather's kind of tales about living in China and of course he was he was quite young i think he was um 7 years old when he came to um to first to Harbin and it kind of made us realize that it would be you know to kind of like to to honor you know, that sort of origin we should sort of see China through a child's eyes and so, you know, it, you know, the the most obvious form for that would be as a children's book. We did change the main character from a boy to a girl, but otherwise, uh, and, and actually, you know, so the character's name is Lucy, and that was uh, also a member of Alexis's family. She was a, a a cousin of her grandfather, who also kind of made the uh, made the escape from Russia and and lived as a refugee in, in China. And, you know, as for the fantasy elements, um, you know, at, at, the, at novel length, I'd never written anything with fantasy, but I've, anything with kind of monsters and magic and so forth, but I have have published uh, a number of fantasy short stories. Um, and, you know, the, I think, you know, the thinking there was that, you know, on the one hand, it, you know, it kind of, it's something exciting for, for younger people to kind of latch onto. And... 
you know, I also believe that fairy tales and folklore are really a wonderful way to kind of get at the heart of a culture and kind of come to know its values and concerns. You know, so I think, you know, all those sort of taken together kind of played into the decision. You know, I'm, and I'm also just sort of a, a sucker for kind of pursuing kind of writing projects where I don't, where I have no experience and kind of want to try something new. I'd never written for children before. And so, you know, I, I, I thought I'd give it a, a whirl. So how was the experience of writing a novel with your wife? How did you two make that work? Well, it was, uh, it's, it's a question we, uh, we field very often. And I think it's, you know, it seems kind of ghastly to many people. But, uh, you know, it was quite a process of trial and error. And so after a few false starts, we figured out the, the best way to collaborate would be to kind of sketch out the broad strokes of the book, of the story, and kind of outline it. And then we would take turns drafting. So at any given time, you know, one writer had kind of sole custody of, of the book, and we would sort of take turns sending it back and forth to one another rather than sort of sitting side by side and, and, uh, and kind of hitting the keys together. And I think we, we tried that once and kind of saw kind of divorce kind of waiting around the corner. So we would, we would kind of pass it back and forth. And I think, you know, through this process, we benefited because it kind of we could – managed to sort of play to each other's strengths. And ultimately, it allowed us to establish kind of a single cohesive voice in the narrative. You know, so I think, you know, people who know us well might be able to pick out some moments where, oh, that, that seems like something Scott would, would say or write, and, oh, that's, that's definitely Alexis. But in general, you know, I, it, it, I, I believe it, it, it kind of comes across as the work of a single mind. And that's, you know, that's very much what we were pursuing. And, and hopefully readers agree with that. As an author, what do you enjoy more, writing fiction or nonfiction? I really enjoy both. But I guess I would have to say fiction kind of moves me just a little bit more. You know, I, I'd say, first of all, you know, whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction, it involves a lot of creativity, a lot of imagination, um, and of course, sort of uh, editorial decision making. But with fiction, I find that kind of creating a world from the ground up is just so bewitching. You know, I, I, I just, it, it's very demanding. It can be extremely frustrating. But to me, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's so rewarding when it, when it happens, when it comes off well. You know, that said, you know, there's a real kind of, there's a real pleasure in the depth at which one can delve with nonfiction. You know, and the Han Shung New War book kind of sprang out of the research I, I did for Silk Road Centurion. I wrote Silk Road Centurion first, you know, but I was just so enthralled by the research and kind of, I, I sensed that this period in Chinese history was just so so seminal and you know is a real kind of a, possibly a way to kind of unlock an understanding about China that I felt like I had to kind of go back in and to do it in a new way and with a different lens uh, with nonfiction so you know that too was was deeply enjoyable you know but if I had to choose one or the other I think um, fiction and especially historical fiction are are kind of you know really what I you know where my where my heart belongs does your uh, background writing fiction influence how you approach nonfiction, such as with the uh, Han Xiong New War book? I would say it does. You know, my goal, um, whether fiction or nonfiction, is not so much to explain, but to immerse. I want my readers to hear, smell, feel the environment that they're in. And, you know, when it's even even when I'm writing about historical figures to do that as much as I can, you know, I, you know, I, I made the, the Han Shung New War book kind of a mosaic of chapter length biographies, you know, in that spirit, you know, often it was very challenging just because the, you know, I, I was confined to sort of what what the historical sources can offer. Um, but still, I, I tried to kind of depict this really complicated conflict through various individuals experiences and you know that that appeals to me kind of as as a storyteller and you know I also thought it might help readers um, who are not so familiar with Chinese history to kind of 
gain a, an, an easier kind of firmer grasp on these events, you know, to kind of, to go in and look at something massive at a, at a very small human scale just seemed, um, you know, that much more accessible. You've made a life for yourself in Japan. Um, why have you written so much about China? Are there other areas of the world which interest you as a setting or subject for your work? Well, I think I, early in our conversation, I mentioned China kind of getting into my blood, and <laughs> that's very much true. You know, I think with its kind of long and well-documented history, China offers just such an inexhaustible well to nourish good storytelling. So it's hard for me to resist dropping a bucket and seeing what comes up. And, you know, I think as a reader, I'm often drawn to fiction, you know, written about a place through the perspective of an, uh, of an outsider. And, you know, despite, you know, living in China for 13 years, I'm very much an outsider. And so, you know, I think that kind of really kind of drives me to, to write about China often. A lot of what I've written about has, has dealt with China and its kind of relationships with, with its neighboring peoples. And I'm kind of more and more becoming interested in, in, in those areas kind of, of, of Central Asia, writing about them without that tether to China. And one project uh, I'm pursuing, uh, again, with Alexis is uh, kind of a, a, another novel kind of written for a slightly older audience, more, more young adult than middle grade of, uh, of The Phoenix and the Firebird. It's, uh, it's a story set in the Silk Road around 300 A.D., and, you know, China is only really kind of obliquely a part of it, but it's, you know, it's really kind of satisfying for me to kind of venture into this kind of new but related territory, you know, but I, but I think I'm just going to keep coming back to that, that China well again and again. I just, uh, I, I can't seem to say no to it. So what might fictional works reveal about China that, you know, work of nonfiction can't? You know, I think, you know, as I touched on earlier, my approach to history is, and, and, you know, into, into writing about any place in any event is sort of is, is through at the, at the human scale. And, you know, I think the sort of the more, the, the, the more massive, the sort of the subject or the history, the better able a reader is to, to approach it kind of through, through an individual character or figure. You know, there's a, a British historical novelist, um, Rosemary Sutcliffe. Um, she's she's a kind of big influence on me. She wrote primarily for for younger audiences, but I only discovered her maybe about seven or eight years ago. And you know, even though she's kind of her her writing is is for someone much younger than myself, I still find it you know very kind of inspirational and instructive. And she wrote an essay entitled "History Is People." And, you know, I think, you know, it's a very simple title, but very powerful. And it sums up, you know, something I think historians and writers can lose sight of. And I kind of really try to follow her example. So in terms of writing fiction, when an author can enter a character's thoughts and kind of use that as soil to kind of grow a fully realized portrayal of a human being, I think that's very valuable. And I think with something that, that can be so so vast and kind of almost you know intimidatingly vast as China, to try to kind of expose aspects of it through through these these kind of these small observers, these these kind of individual characters, I think kind of can can shed light on it and kind of make it accessible and kind of more universal than than kind of other kinds of writing about China um, maybe can't as easily. Obviously, I'm biased. You know, I'm I'm kind of a partisan for writing fiction, but that's that's kind of my view. I think that you know, you know, the the ability to show show kind of Chinese characters in multiple dimensions makes them you know for for kind of Western audiences, it can make people that might seem outlandish and kind of unknowable more fully realized and a lot easier to grasp and understand. And so you know, I guess that's that's kind of a goal I have with my writing is to sort of provide a gateway for for readers to kind of find their way into the kind of the fascinating history of china so uh the phoenix and the firebird only just came out but uh, you got any new book ideas planned for 2025 and beyond i do i'm just finalizing a manuscript now it's called when the carp becomes a dragon 
it's set in the Southern Song Dynasty, and it follows a a young hopeful for the uh, imperial civil service exams, who's making his way to kind of sit the first the first round of tests, only to encounter a mortally wounded soldier, who entrusts him to care to kind of complete his mission to d- to deliver a kind of a priceless Chinese artifact to safety before the Mongols can can lay claim to it and and use it to make their assert their claim as the true uh, holders of the mandate of heaven so it, you know it's it's been great fun to write and research you know again i you know i have i have uh china and a kind of a nomadic empire clashing but uh unlike silk run centurion this time i follow multiple characters rather than just one and so I can kind of really touch touch upon many different kind of elements and aspects of of Chinese and Mongol society. So it's been a real thrill to write, and and I hope uh, someday soon there'll be some news about when and how readers can, can find it. Okay, well, this one's running a little long. I don't want to keep you on this lovely Saturday. It's lunchtime over in your time zone. I've uh, I've enjoyed this discussion and wish you and Alexis happy hunting with this new book, The Phoenix and the Firebird. I'll have links to everything at the show notes. Scott Crawford, I thank you for making time to come on the CHP, and I look forward to your next visit. Laszlo, this was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. The pleasure was all mine. All right, that's going to be that for this time. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from L.A., California. I thank you all for tuning in, and... I hope you'll consider coming back next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.